And one can say it, things have really you know, gotten worse from crotch grabbing to breast exposing. Um, and, and I do think it is important to uh, clear up that, uh, and Judge Bork was really assailed from this, that Nine Inch Nails both is and is not an artist. Nine Inch Nails is not a rapper. Um, does that refute the critique of the book? Well, I recently had occasion to uh, consult with my 13-year-old son about Linkin Park. Um, and Linkin Park is, their, their, their lyrics are so bad that they actually have to release two versions of their CDs, the censored version and the uncensored version. So I don't think things have gotten uh, much better. And again, I think the description in the book really is, is very, very, very vivid. Um, and to tee the, again, just to tee this up, I want to uh, tell a quick story, and again, in, in a capacity as parent. Um, read Judge Bork's book, Before I Had Children. I read James Davison Holden Hunter's book and Alan Bloom's book, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so for a variety of reasons, my wife and I are raising our children as Orthodox Jews. We send them to an Orthodox Jewish day school, and we try and really shelter them from the corrosive culture to the extent possible. They can't surf the internet unsupervised, no commercial TV. We really try and, and, and you know, keep, keep them, uh, you know, protect them to the extent possible. But my son does live in the world, and so he wanted to go to uh, Spider-Man 3. And I went to commonsensemedia.org, looked it up, and there, you know, looked at what the messages were, and it looked like Spider-Man 3 was an okay movie to go to. So we went to Spider-Man 3 together, and uh, then there were the two previews. And one preview was about two heterosexual men who are forced by the bureaucracy, for reasons I couldn't quite figure out from the preview, to masquerade as gay a gay married couple. The movie is called I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And then the second movie, the second preview, um, was about a man who whenever he has relations with a woman, she, the next person whom she dates, she falls in love and gets married. And so he has this curse. And so hundreds and hundreds of women in this preview throw themselves at this man, because if they sleep with him, then the next w person who they find will be their beloved. And the jokes range to, uh, you know, women who want to have relations with him before, you know, even before, before dinner, in the car, here, there. Um, there's one, one moment where uh, you know, his, his, his phone is ringing off the hook, and he listens to his voicemails, um, and there's a male voice and say, just hear me out. Um, <laughs> Um, and then, and the way this movie called Good Luck Chuck, eh, the, the preview ends, what is it about the name Chuck these days, I, I don't know, um, ends with, with uh, the, the man uh, who's this, this accursed person saying, what is fornication without love? And his friend, the uh, chubby uh, fellow who's the, you know, I guess the comic uh, relief says, sex, it's still sex. And I had to sit there with my 13-year-old and listen to this. So I think that Judge Bork's critique of the culture holds up, as does, frankly, the desire. I won't say the case, but the desire for censorship. That said, here's the problem I had with Chapter 8, the case for censorship, when I read it. I posed it to the judge. And I still have the following problem. And we have a, a, a really esteemed panel to help us address some of these issues. The problem is that if Judge Bork is correct that the liberals man the ramparts of the culture, to paraphrase him, how is it that censorship is going to work? When the judge writes about censorship, I often have the impression that, it's, that he views it as, well, he, George Will, Walter Burns, and Irving Crystal sitting around smoking cigarettes deciding what we're going to watch. And I'd be OK with that. I'd be up with that. But there are two problems. One is that they can't possibly watch everything that's out there. And the second is, even if they did, if you really believe that this stuff is corrosive, then you'd have to keep replacing them every so often, because the deviancy would be defined down, and their standards would slide even. And then we'd have to find more George Wills and Judge Borks and Walter Burns and Irving Crystals to engage in this enterprise. Why would they want to do it? And in any event, uh, at least those four, and particularly Judge Bork, are irreplaceable. So to debate these issues, we have, again, a very esteemed panel. I am going to introduce each one bef just before they speak, so we have the opportunity to properly, rec properly recognize them. And the first is Robert George, who is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in Ideals and Institutions at Princeton, member of the President's Council on Bioethics. He's been on the uh, United States Commission.
And so that made it worth it to me for sure. Uh, I uh, said in that blurb, got it right here, the ideological triumph of liberalism among American elites, far from bringing the individual and social enlightenment it promised, has produced unprecedented decay. The principal victims of this decay are the poorest and most vulnerable among us, those most in need of a healthy culture. Bork courageously and boldly states these truths. A judge as wise as Solomon has become a prophet as powerful as Isaiah. Well, I believed that uh, then and I believe it now. If anything, I believe it more strongly now. Now, it was not that I agreed with everything Judge Bork uh, said in the book. Uh, I only agreed with the parts Mary Ellen agreed with. Uh, the other parts I didn't agree with. I strongly dissented, for example, from uh, Judge Bork's attitude of suspicion toward the uh, natural rights teaching and equality doctrine of the Declaration of Independence, though even in the chapters, it must be said, even in the chapters of slouching, uh, slouching in which he articulates the grounds of his skepticism about the Declaration, uh, I found characteristically Borkian flashes of insight and many important truths. What seemed to me to be most prophetic about the book was precisely its appreciation of the soul-shaping, soul-shaping role of culture and the book's deadly accurate description and warning about the ways in which the triumph of liberal ideology among American elites was, was eroding, corroding public morality and damaging the interests of all of us but especially the poorest and most vulnerable among us, the interest in maintaining a social environment that is more or less hospitable to virtue and at least minimally inhospitable to what the great British jurist Patrick Devlin once described as the grosser forms of vice. He hit the nail on the head about phenomena like the phenomena Dan uh, explained and described uh, to us when he took his son to see Spider-Man. Well, I have in my uh, own writings, both uh, before slouching and after, offered philosophical criticisms of what I regard as the illusion of moral neutrality that is the centerpiece of much liberal and libertarian uh, legal and political theory, uh, political theory of the sort that has been uh, championed by uh, John Rawls, for example, uh, Ronald Dworkin, uh, Robert uh, Nozick. Uh, I've tried to illustrate the many and, in some cases, profound ways in which beliefs, attitudes, and choices are shaped in any society, not just in ours, in any society, by the framework of understandings and expectations that, to a considerable extent, constitute, for better or worse, a society's public morality and would do so even in the strict libertarians' utopia. I've sought to show that the acts of private parties, even the apparently private acts of private parties, can and often do have public consequences. Indeed, sometimes very extensive and profound public consequences. It will come as no surprise then that I found Judge Bork's refocusing of our attention on public morality to be valuable and even prophetic. Of course, the next question for those of us who see things as Judge Bork and I see them is, okay, now what do we do about it? Now, truth be told, in the period from roughly the middle 1960s to the slouching of Gomorrah in the mid-1990s, there had been not nearly enough attention focused even on the phenomenon of the decline of public morality. Very little focus indeed on the very concept of public morality. It seemed to disappear, at least from the scholarly uh, literature, except as an item of ridicule. But even less discussion of what might be done to rebuild a public culture that was in fact at least minimally inhospitable to the grosser forms of, of vice, and at least more or less hospitable uh, to encouraging virtue. 
So the question is, what are the legitimate and illegitimate means of upholding or restoring public morality? What is likely to work and what is likely to prove futile or even to do more harm than good? We can all think of ways in which the effort to rebuild public morality would do more harm than good. Uh, some people, I think it's, it's an implausible view, but there are some people uh, who believe that any effort to rebuild public morality would do uh, more harm than good, or at least any use of the law toward that end. But that brings us, of course, to the next question. What is the role and what are the limits of law in the establishment and maintenance of public morality or a moral ecology that assists us in our own lives and in bringing up our children, as Dan is trying to do, as I'm trying to do, as many of you are trying to do, as some of your children are trying to do, to be decent and honorable people. Now here, Bob and I, Judge Bork and I, break from our strict libertarian friends, and we will be reprimanded for it, I'm sure, uh, by Professor Soman, uh, among others, in just a few minutes. We do think that law and public policy can play a constructive role in protecting not only public health and safety, but public morals as well. Judge Bork, in slouching, was even willing to cause scandal and outrage by putting in a good word for censorship, as Dan mentioned. Now, I myself would never support the censoring of ideas and arguments however evil and revolting the causes in which they are advanced. But while I would defend, for example, Larry Flint's right to advocate a free market in hardcore pornography, and even his right to encourage pornography as a tool of personal and social liberation, as vile an idea as I think that is, I would have no objection in principle and can think easily of circumstances under which I would be willing to support forbidding Flint by law from producing and distributing his smut. If there is a case against shutting down operations like Hustler, it is and is merely a prudential case, not a case based on natural rights, liberty, equality, or justice, or so it seems to me. In my own criticisms, for example, of John Stuart Mill's harm principle or of uh, uh, modern and contemporary um, defenses of that principle and application to some of the um, issues that people who think about public morality think about, uh, I've made the argument uh, that there is no ground of moral principle on which Mill's position can be defended, although in the case of any proposal to use the mechanism of the law, especially in its coercive aspects, uh, to forbid uh, wrongdoing, there are always a range of prudential questions that have to be asked. And sometimes the weight of argument, as a matter of prudence, will militate against using the force of the law. We can all think of so many reasons. Take, for example, the drug prohibition uh, debate. Now, it seems to me that there is no sound, valid argument for a right to use uh, drugs on a recreational basis, hallucinogens and other uh, products like that. Uh, I've never found an argument, whether advanced by someone on the libertarian side or someone on the uh, liberal side, a Dworkin or a Rawls, uh, that I found even remotely persuasive in trying to establish that there's some sort of a right to use drugs, a right to do wrong. However, it seems to me that critics of drug prohibition have made a pretty powerful case. I don't myself find it in the end persuasive, but I think it's a serious case perhaps one I'm wrong to reject on prudential grounds against drug prohibition in favor of drug decriminalization or legalization. In any event, I think that's where the argument has to be, not as to whether people have a right to do immoral things, but rather on the question of whether the effort to use the coercive force of the law will be counterproductive, be futile, do more harm than good by, for example, encouraging police corruption or a black market uh, or uh, leading to the prohibition of, of uh, legitimate uh, things that might fall under too sweeping uh, a prohibition or too sweeping a censorship. 
In the area of censorship, for example, there are arguments having to do with whether efforts to ban stuff that really does deserve to be banned, banned will lead to the banning of material, literature, art, uh, uh, movies that actually do have uh, important uh, literary and artistic uh, merit. Now, that's not necessarily to say that the prudential argument always comes down against prohibition. It's only to say that someone considering what his position ought to be on the question, whether it's a policymaker or a citizen of a democratic society, needs to be considering carefully the weight of prudential arguments each way. It's not a knockdown, for example, even to prove that if we prohibit Hustler, there will in some circumstances in some parts of the country be prohibitions of literature that actually should not be prohibited because it is meritorious. Uh, th how, what the error uh, position, what the default position should be, uh, is itself a matter for uh, argument. It, it requires us to consider what damage is being done in a society in which, especially to our young people, in which pornography flows as freely and flourishes uh, as it does in our uh, society. But the argument, it seems to me, is a prudential one. Uh, let me just uh, conclude these remarks with a brief comment about the role of law and government in upholding a public morality in circumstances where it does have a legitimate role, where it passes uh, not only the test that I think it will always pass, uh, so long as what it's prohibiting is actually uh, something wicked, but even where it passes uh, the test, uh, all the tests of prudence. And that comment is this, that the role of law and government is always secondary and subsidiary. Well, it seems to me the role of law and government in protecting us from crime, from assault, is primary. It seems to me in the area we're now talking about, the role of law and government is secondary. And I think this is a point on which Judge Bork uh, would agree. Uh, he can say for himself whether he does. There's certainly nothing in the book that would um, uh, get in the way of his sharing that view with me. The primary role, it seems to me, in this area is played by families, churches, the institutions of civil society, organizations such as the Boy Scouts that are concerned fundamentally, fundamentally with character formation and which by working closely with individuals can actually do a good job of inculcating an understanding of morality and promoting virtue. Despite the fact, that is to say, that public morality is indeed a public good, its maintenance depends far more on contributions of private institutions, beginning with the family, than on those of law and government. And we go wrong on the non-libertarian side if we invert them and ascribe to government and law the primary role. Where families, churches, and other institutions of civil society fail, or where they're unable, perhaps because of legal impediments, to play their parts properly, laws will hardly suffice to preserve public morals. Ordinarily, at least, law's role is supportive. That's what I mean by secondary, subsidiary. Its role is to support families, churches, and the like in the task of forming honorable and decent citizens and human beings. And of course, finally, a point that can never be stressed often enough, law goes wrong when it displaces those institutions of civil society, when it displaces, when it undermines, when it pushes aside the church, the family, other character-shaping institutions, uh, and uh, substitutes itself for them, abdicating, uh, forcing them, in a sense, to abdicate their own responsibilities. Now, at the same time, uh, while we must be aware of a usurpation of familial or religious authority uh, by government, it's also important to note that the role of law in holding, upholding public morality, even though the role is secondary, is itself undermined by families, by religious communities, churches and other religious institutions, and other institutions who abdicate their primary responsibility, or even worse, institutions that by their actions promote false and morally destructive practices. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. And now for something completely different. Um,
Ilya Soman is an assistant professor at George Mason University School of Law. Uh, he focuses on constitutional law, property law, the study of politi popular political participation and its implica implications for constitutional democracy. He's a very active blogger. He's previously served as the Olin Fellow in Law at Northwestern. Um, he clerked for Judge Jerry Smith of the Fifth Circuit, uh, has a BA summa cum laude from Amherst, an MA from Harvard, a JD from Yale, and will soon complete his PhD from Harvard. Thank you for being here, Professor Selman. Uh, I'd like to thank Dan and the Federalist Society for organizing this panel and for inviting me here to sort of be a kind of libertarian skunk at this particular garden party, uh, as the previous uh, panelists already alluded to. Uh, my purpose, to some extent at least, is to criticize Judge Bork and his view of uh, government's role in regulating the culture. However, I think I'm here as much to praise Judge Bork as to criticize him because, to my mind, the principles that Judge Bork advocates in a book discussed at the last panel, the antitrust paradox are just as much applicable to government regulation of culture as they are to government regulation of the economy. Indeed, to some extent, they're even more applicable for reasons that I'm going to go into in a moment. Uh, so in my presentation, uh, I'm going to follow on a principle that uh, Judge Easterbrook discussed in his presentation on the antitrust paradox, where he summarized Bork's approach in that book as stating that regulators should not second guess the results of markets. Uh, and I think this applies just as much to cultural markets uh, as it applies to products markets or other subjects uh, that he discussed in, the, in his work on antitrust law. Uh, and indeed, I found it interesting to be reminded earlier today that one of Bork's mentors at the University of Chicago was Aaron Director. And in 1964, Aaron Director actually wrote a famous article on the very subject of this panel, an article called The Parody of the Economic Marketplace. In that article, Director pointed out that government regulation of cultural markets and of speech has much the same weaknesses and much the same characteristics as government regulation of uh, more, more traditional economic activity. Now, director's main objective was to criticize political liberals and leftists who wanted to leave free, for the most part, the culture and, and speech, but at the same time regulate the economy. But of course, the argument works also in reverse to criticize conservatives such as Judge Bork, who want to forego most economic regulation, but do want a very heavy government role uh, in censoring the culture. So in the first part of my presentation, I'm going to explain why, in fact, uh, government censorship of the culture is not pre Student to use Dan, I'm sorry, to use uh, Professor George's terminology because it cannot be contained within the sort of role that uh, George and also Pro Judge Bork would out want to outline. Second, I'm going to talk somewhat about uh, why that sort of government regulation is in fact not needed and that actually the sorts of private institutions uh, that Dan Troy alluded to can do a much better job of setting the culture and creating desirable cultural values than government can. Uh, and finally, I'll end up with a brief comment uh, on the links between the argument I'm presenting here and the one that Judge Bork made in the antitrust paradox. Uh, but first, I'd like to briefly note something that Professor George has, always, has already alluded to, and that is the radical sweep of Judge Bork's vision in this book. While Judge Bork is, I think, quite correctly usually viewed as a conservative, uh, there are some quite radical implications of slouching towards Gomorrah. For instance, he not only criticizes modern libertarians or modern liberals, he also goes all the way back to the source, so to speak, and attacks the Enlightenment, the Declaration of Independence, and John Stuart Mill. So in a very real sense, there's a lot at stake in considering Judge Bork's argument in slouching, because if we accept it, we would have to reject a very large part of the American tradition of individual freedom, and perhaps even the broader Western tradition uh, of liberalism broadly defined. Uh, fortunately, at least to my mind, I hope to convince you that we don't need to do that, and in fact, uh, it would be much better to reach the narrower conclusion that it may be desirable to reject Judge Bork's call for censorship of the culture. So first, I think it's important to recognize a major conceptual problem with government regulation of the culture. That is the fundamental conflict of interest the government has in this area. The people who lead the government, the minions of the state, have a strong incentive to use the power to regulate culture to suppress their political opponents and instead engage in indoctrination to promote their own favorite ideas and to maintain their own grip on power. And if you look at the history of government regulation 
formation of culture, the desire to indoctrinate is in fact a large part of the motive for the creation of institutions of censorship and even for the creation to some extent of public education uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and this is actually something that perhaps would not have come as a surprise to the Judge Bork who wrote The Antitrust Paradox, because after all, he pointed out uh, in that book that uh, often the facilities of antitrust law can be captured by interest groups and used for their own purposes rather than for the purposes for which they were initially set up. And the same thing is true, and I would argue even more true, uh, of the institutions of cultural regulation and censorship, because those more directly impinge on the ability and desire of government uh, to perpetuate its own grip on power and to try to suppress potential opposition. Uh, and in fact, the empirical record, I think, provides ample evidence for support for this proposition that this major conflict of interest the government has in this area is, in fact, a serious concern. Uh, in his book, uh, Judge Bork suggests that, well, we don't need to worry about this too much because, after all, for the first 150 years of American history, there was very little judicial enforcement of the First Amendment, and therefore censorship was allowed to at least to some extent to run free. My view of the record is a lot less sanguine than Judge Bork's because if you look at that 150 years of history, we see numerous examples of harmful censorship. For example, there was the Alien and Sedition Act in 1798 directly attempting to suppress the opponents of the government. There was for many decades the suppression of abolitionist speech in the southern states prior to the Civil War. Uh, there was the censorship of serious literature uh, on, under the pretext of censoring pornography or obscenity. Uh, and there are many examples of works of serious literature, works even that I think Judge Bork would consider to be serious literature that were so suppressed. And I could probably fill up this entire talk just by listing these sorts of examples. So I'm not at all convinced that the first 150 years of American history proves that we can trust government with this power without seeing very serious abuses. The record of similar power in Europe and other uh, democratic states today, I think, equally bears out the same concern. In many European nations, government has a considerably freer hand to censor and to regulate the culture uh, than it does in the U.S. today, uh, and we certainly see serious problems. Uh, for example, in a recent article uh, co-authored with John McGinnis, uh, I noted the problem in Europe of the, the use of uh, law to censor speech criticizing radical Islamism, or in some cases criticizing homosexuality, uh, and certainly uh, European governments have not uh, been restrained in their use of the power to censor. Uh, nor is there reason to expect them to be restrained in this way uh, because, as I said, of the incentives uh, that they have both to perpetuate their own grip on power and also in some cases to yield to the lobbying uh, of powerful interest groups uh, that may want to capture the censorship process for their own purposes. Now, as I've already suggested, it's important to recognize a problem that Dan Troy alluded to in his introduction to this panel. And that is, it would be one thing if you could say, well, we can be absolutely certain that this power to censor will always be held by Judge Bork or by Robert George uh, or by other like-minded people. Frankly, I'm not sure that I would be willing to accept it even if that were true, but I know some of you perhaps would be. However, we cannot, in fact, not be assured of any such thing. The power that we might want to give to Judge Bork or to a conservative conservative president will sooner or later, and right now probably sooner rather than later, will be wielded by a liberal president just as much uh, or even more so and has already been wielded uh, by liberal and left-wing governments in Europe. So even if you're comfortable with the idea that Judge Bork might censor the culture and make decisions about what's permissible or you're comfortable with Robert George doing that, ask yourself this question. Are you equally comfortable with Ted Kennedy doing so or with Hillary Clinton doing so? And I would suggest that if a power... That, that if there's a power to censor that you would not trust Hillary Clinton with, then you probably wouldn't want to trust government in general with that power, given the likelihood and indeed inevitability that even if Hillary Clinton doesn't win in 2008, someone like her probably will win uh, sooner or later in the future. Uh, now, I have to admit that you could argue, well, yes, there is this risk, but perhaps the risk should be run because, after all, that's the only way to maintain a healthy culture. Judge Bork argues that without censorship, the culture is going to continue its inevitable slide into Gomorrah uh, and stagnation and so forth. Uh, in my view, there's no reason for this fear, uh, and in actuality, both theory and empirical evidence suggest that the free market and civil society can do a much better job in this area than government can ever hope to do. Uh, I think the timing of Judge Bork's book was, to some extent, 
unfortunate, and it was written in the mid-1990s. And in the book, Judge Bork says, well, only through this kind of governmental control of the culture uh, can we avoid social pathology such as crime, illegitimacy, rising welfare dependency, and so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately for Judge Bork's thesis, in the years since the book was published, all of those indicators of social pathology have greatly decreased. Crime certainly has, welfare dependency certainly has, illegitimacy, even divorce. Uh, and it's important to recognize that not only did these indicators greatly improve, but this improvement was achieved despite the near total absence of the kind of censorship that Judge Bork said was essential to achieve this kind of progress. Indeed, with the rise of the internet uh, and other modern communications media, I would bet that sexual and violently explicit material is probably much more available today than it was uh, 10 or 15 years ago when Judge Bork wrote the book. International comparisons also bear out this point. There are countries such as Japan in which sexually explicit or violently explicit material is even more readily available than the United States, and yet their rates of social pathology continue to be significantly lower than ours. Uh, so the relationship between an absence of censorship and social pathology, to my mind, is far less clear than Judge Bork suggests in the book, and therefore the case for censorship is that much weaker as a result. Now, in addition, there are, in fact, very compelling private sector alternatives to enable people to shape the cultural environment around themselves and their children without resorting to coercion of the state, and indeed much more effectively than they could get probably through state coercion. For example, as Robert Nelson points out in an important recent book, today some 30 million Americans live in private planned communities of various types, uh, and if they so choose, people in such communities can create a culturally conservative environment or other types of environments and can do so without imposing those preferences uh, on other citizens who may think differently from them. Similarly, as Dan Troy pointed out, we have private schools, and I think conservatives are quite correct to champion the cause of private schools, uh, private schools which might inculcate religious values uh, or other values chosen by the parents rather than by the state. And finally, of course, there's the role of religious institutions and other institutions of civil society. Uh, now, in his presentation, Professor George says, well, certainly these associations should have the primary role uh, in promoting a healthy culture, but maybe government should have a subsidiary role. At some level of abstractness, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but there are two problems. One is the one that I've already alluded to, which is the great difficulty of keeping government within a subsidiary role once it's, it's, that role has been allocated to it. But secondly, uh, government, if it's allowed to strongly regulate the culture, can actually often undermine those very private private institutions uh, on which Professor George and I both would want to depend uh, for the promotion of a healthy culture. Certainly an aggressive government regulating the culture will try to undermine private schools, it will try to undermine religious institutions, uh, and it will try to undermine other civil society organizations in part because all of those organizations are competitors with the state in terms of promoting ideas and the state, as I said, will have a strong incentive to try to instead indoctrinate people in its own ideas uh, and try to to eliminate as much as, power, as, much as possible uh, competition for power with it. Uh, and certainly that, to some extent, is exactly what has happened in many European countries, and even to a limited degree with government regulation of private schools and other institutions uh, right here in the United States. Uh, so ultimately, to my mind, the question is not whether a healthy culture is important. I agree that it is. The key question is, do you trust government to that, even government run by someone like Hillary Clinton, or would you trust churches, schools, and other private institutions to do a better job? Uh, I think both theory and empirical evidence strongly suggest that the private sector is the way to go here and not government. And I think that the Robert Bork, who, who wrote this antitrust paradox, understood that in the realm of antitrust law and outlined a series of arguments why that, for the most part, is true in that area. I think those arguments are even more applicable to the cultural sphere, because in that sphere, government has an even more serious conflict of interest than it does with respect to antitrust. At least in the area of antitrust, in most cases, uh, if government uh, adopts a, uh, does not have incentives to adopt a flawed policy, because that flawed policy is likely to keep the government in power uh, or appease extremely important interest groups. In the cultural sphere, that conflict of interest is much more direct and it's all the more reason to distrust government in this area even more thoroughly than Robert Bork rightly said we should distrust it in the economic sphere. Thank you.
thank you very much. Um, our final speaker, and we're going to leave some time, we hope, for some uh, stimulating discussion, is uh, Steve Calabresi, whom we all know well, who's co-founded the Federal Society and serves as the chairman of the Society's Board of Directors. Uh, he served in the Reagan and Bush, first Bush administrations from 1985 to 1990, advised Attorney General Ed Meese, um, and the head of domestic policy during Ronald Reagan, uh, Ken Cribb. He wrote speeches for uh, Vice President Quayle. Uh, since joining, joining the Northwestern faculty in 1990, he has published more than 30 articles and comments in law reviews, including some wonderful originalist papers on uh, the, the, the executive, uh, executive power. Uh, he's the George C. Dix Professor of Constitutional Law for 1998 to 2000 and for 2004 to 2007, and he was, most famously of all, a clerk for Judge Bork. And I want to tell a very quick story about Steve. I never heard this from the horse's mouth, but there was a rumor about that uh, Justice Ginsburg was always very angry at Steve Calabresi because, and I've just heard this in the ether, that she was mad that he, quote unquote, radicalized Judge Bork. Now, I wonder what this says about such well-known liberal squishes as John Harrison. Um, but, but it's always struck me as a little bit odd, and maybe we can discuss this, to describe Judge Bork as a radical, as I think Professor Soman did as well. Because the, one of the themes in the book is not that egalitarianism is bad or that individualism is bad. It's that anything pressed too far can become a problem. And it seems to me, and I was very interested to hear that um, uh, the, the judge used to sort of argue with, uh, with uh, Alexander Bickel, who was Burkean. I've always thought of the judge as very Burkean and is sort of, sort of having become a Tory. So, um, and, and, and in that sense, he, I, he's always struck me as, an, you know, paradoxically, very moderate. So I'd be very interested in, you know, some commentary on that. But um, you, want to, you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from Steve Calabresi. So. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be on this panel with Dan Troy, Robbie George, and Ilya Soman, and to comment on Judge Bork's masterful book, Slouching Toward Gomorrah. By now, you've heard some sharp disagreements on the question of governmental efforts to enforce morality and on the proper relationship between law, religion, morality, and the public culture. Uh, I want to discuss two theoretical questions uh, that I think are raised by Judge Bork's book and that are implicit in the comments that the previous two panelists mentioned. First, what is the proper relationship between law, religion, morality, and the public culture? And second, is it appropriate for government to punish individual conduct that does not directly harm another individual? I will take up each of these questions in turn. First, on the question of the relationship between law, religion, morality, and the public culture, one of the things that I think characterizes the Western legal traditions is a commitment to the idea that there is and ought to be a sharp separation between law and organized religion. We think law is influenced by but is distinguishable from religion and that religious bodies ought to be free of government control. Our judges are not priests and our courts are not ecclesiastical bodies. We have a separate core of people who study and train to be lawyers from those who study and train to be priests. We think the law is independent of not only church officials but also of government and that it's a body of rules that grows and changes over time, unlike the Islamic Sharia. It's precisely because law is not divinely prescribed in the West that we believe it can change and develop over time. There are other important legal traditions in the world, both historically and today, that have denied the idea that there is and ought to be a separation between law and organized religion. Many fundament fundamentalist Muslims disagree with the Western idea that law and religion ought to be separated. And some Western Europeans and many Americans rightly wonder if we've gone too far in separating law and religion. Western law has its roots in the Judeo-Christian religious traditions, but for 2,000 years now it has evolved in its own distinct directions. The Western separation of law and religion itself may have religious underpinnings. One of the cardinal teachings of the New Testament is that we ought all to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. But while the Western tradition embraces a sharp separation between law and organized religion, it most emphatically has not embraced a, sh a separation between law and morality 
or uh, law and the shaping of the public culture. For 2,000 years, most of our laws in the West have grown out of moral ideas and intuitions, and for this we can be eternally grateful. A body of law that was not rooted in morality would be hateful and unjust, which is why even the crazy secularists in American society are not always in favor of separating law and morality. American secularists uh, rightly favor legislating morality and shaping the public culture through the use of civil rights laws, environmental laws, hate speech laws, uh, and bans on smoking. What they are against is using law to legislate certain religious moral ideas. What they never explain is why it's okay to base laws that shape the public culture and morality on John Stuart Mill, but not on the morality of St. Thomas Aquinas. Where then did the American shibboleth come from that says you cannot successfully legislate morality? I suspect it's a residue of the failed social experiment that was prohibition. I think what people really mean when they say you can't legislate morality is that efforts to legislate morality and shape the public culture that are widely at variance with public attitudes about what is right and wrong are likely to fail. It is a categorical error, however, to conclude that government cannot legislate morality and shape the public culture. This raises a question of how uh, government, how comprehensively government can and ought to regulate morality. Should government criminalize all violations of Judeo-Christian moral teachings, including failing to tithe or failing to help the poor or failing to help love your neighbor as yourself? Uh, I think that those more very ambitious efforts to use law to totally reshape uh, human society uh, are ultimately unlikely to succeed. Um, this is because both it's both because of human nature and uh, the difficulty of perfecting man, and really the impossibility of perfecting man in this in this world, and also because of the corruptibility of uh, of government of, uh, officials and of the people who would be doing the, the shaping of the culture. I think that one can fall back, however, on tradition and traditional regulations of morality to improve human behavior, even if you cannot make it perfect. Um, the, the point of slouching toward Gomorrah, as I take it, is that in America today, the great problem we face is not one of excessive entanglement of government with, with religion, but one of excessive hesitation on the part of government in enforcing moral ideas with religious underpinnings. And on this, I think Judge Bork is indisputably correct. Judge Bork's complaint is that in the years since James Madison wrote the Federalist Papers, each generation of Americans has become less and less shaped by religion, until today we've arrived at a state of near barbarism in some respects. This is a serious critique of the whole American project, and it's one that I have sympathy with. Judge Bork is absolutely right that in our eagerness to preserve a separation of church and state, uh, it, is ins uh, it is insane to drive religious morality out of the law, and that's what we've been trying to do. The content of our law, as I said, is rooted in the moral precepts of our Judeo-Christian religious traditions, and it is this content that makes our law just and worthy of being obeyed. Uh, the positive law of Nazi Germany or of the uh, Stalin Soviet Union ought not to have been obeyed. What, what makes American law... Uh, uh, deserving of, of obedience is precisely that it is moral. So I think at some level, government and law have to promote uh, morality, and there has to be a connection uh, between the two. Now, I want to talk about what I think has been the harder question in the West over the last 150 years, and that is, what about laws that seek to promote morality where an individual has not directly harmed another individual? What about government efforts to pr promote morality by preventing people from harming themselves? Laws against drinking alcohol or gambling or prostitution or drug use or assisted suicide or consuming pornography or for that matter mutually consensual dueling. Should these so-called victimless crimes be decriminalized? In Western Europe, many of these activities have been substantially decriminalized. In the United States, however, the picture is more mixed. Some activities like alcohol consumption and gambling are mostly legal. Others like assisted suicide and drug use are still illegal, although the laws are imperfectly enforced. To, in, in analyzing this question, 
I think we have to begin by recognizing that the crimes in question are not, in fact, totally victimless. The most common victims of victimless crimes are children and other family members. When a person abuses alcohol or drugs or commits suicide or is sexually promiscuous, he or she hurts any children they may have, they hurt their spouse, they hurt their parents and siblings, they hurt their friends, and it really is therefore a fiction to say that victimless crimes are, are victimless. Just as fundamentally, a person who engages in these activities does damage to themselves, and that is a moral, a moral wrong. Can the law police, this, uh, police risky self-destructive behavior to allow what is valuable or prohibit what is not without bringing on the suffocation of a totalitarian state? I think the answer is a qualified yes, so long as we recognize several major limitations of law when it comes to paternalistic regulation. The first big limit on government paternalism is that efforts to, by government to promote morality by outlawing so-called victimless crimes may run the risk of giving prosecutors enormous discretion in enforcing the law, discretion which can be abused. A second problem uh, with laws against victimless crimes is that some of them, such as, as we saw during Prohibition, may be widely disobeyed, and that could cause ordinary people to hold the legal system in less regard. And a third problem with morals laws uh, is that uh, a pers if they are enforced sporadically, a person may not effectively have notice before they disobey a law uh, that something is actually illegal. The conclusion that's usually drawn from these reservations is that morals offenses ought to be decriminalized, and thus many libertarians argue for decriminalization of drugs, prostitution, and assisted suicide, just as we decriminalize the sale of alcohol after prohibition. I'm opposed to that. Too many people look to the law for teaching as to what is right and moral for decriminal decriminalization of morals offenses to be desirable. When we decriminalized gambling in the 1970s, there was an explosion in gambling, and lots of people concluded that because gambling was legal, it must be morally unproblematic for people to gamble. Even state governments became confused on this issue, and so we have the spectacle of many state governments uh, sponsoring gambling through lotteries and advertising to encourage their citizens to gamble. I'm convinced that if we legalize drugs, prostitution, and assisted suicide, there would be an explosion of morally self-destructive behavior in all these areas. I'm not even confident that the government would not encourage immoral behavior itself by, for example, selling drugs in state-owned for-profit stores or running state-owned brothels, or encouraging elderly patients with he expensive health care premiums to consider assisted suicide. Like it or not, the law teaches moral lessons, and especially in America, people are quite prone to believe that what is legal is also moral. There is another tool in addition to the criminal law that government has at its disposal that I think it can make use of to shape the public culture, um, and that is advertising. One of the most successful morals campaigns of all times has surely been the national morals campaign uh, against smoking that the federal government has waged since 1964. Smoking and lung cancer rates have decreased dramatically as a result of that campaign, and social disapproval of smoking is much higher now than it ever was in the 1960s. Advertising against tobacco has changed the climate of social opinion about the morality of smoking. Uh, the same thing could be done with respect to all to other victimless, uh, other so-called victimless crimes. All of this leads me to conclude with a suggestion on the great legislation of morality issue of our day, which is whether we should again criminalize some or all second and first trimester abortions. I think we should again outlaw abortions with the punishment falling most heavily on abortion providers. Abortion is much further than drug abuse from being a victimless crime since there is a victim with abortions in the form of an unborn baby, as slouching toward Gamora makes clear. But assume for the moment that the advocates of decriminalized abortion are sincere when they claim, as former, in former Bill, President Bill Clinton's words, that abortion ought to be safe, legal, and rare. What better way to start making legal uh, abortions rarer than for government to start running advertisements educating the public on the facts of fetal development and encouraging women to think of adoption instead of, uh, instead of abortion. How many women who choose to have abortions know when fetal heartbeats begin or how early brain waves develop or how early unborn babies begin to feel pain? 
If these facts were as widely disseminated as the information about the harm that smoking can cause in terms of lung cancer, it would greatly affect the public culture with respect to abortion. And the same approach, I think, I submit, could be taken in other areas as well. So I guess I think it's inevitable that law will shape the public culture. I think it always has and it always will. And the question is whether we will continue to reject efforts to draw on religious morality in shaping the public culture and only draw on secular moral notions instead. Thank you. One round for the uh, panelists to uh, respond to one another. Professor Soman, in particular, did you have any comments, particularly on what uh, Professor Calabresi you know, said at the, at, towards the end of his talk? Uh, yeah, actually, that's what I was going to allude to a little bit. Uh, to my surprise, I found myself disagreeing much more with Steve than I did with uh, what Professor George said. Uh, and in particular, I want to raise the issue of advertising. It relates something somewhat to my own scholarly work and also to uh, you know, to the things I said in my remarks, I agree. Certainly, occasionally, government advertising can promote true ideas, such as the idea that smoking is bad for your health. Uh, but Steve does not consider his remarks to government uh, advertising or government propaganda, to use a more conventional term, uh, can also be used to promote falsehoods and incorrect ideas. Uh, for example, in our own history, that has often happened uh, in the 1930s, government advertising was used to promote the idea of national economic planning. Uh, more recently, has been used to promote uh, various ideas about sexual and other forms of harassment that uh, I know many of us here would, dis would disapprove of. So the key question is, what is the incentive of government to use advertising to promote truth as opposed to falsehood or as opposed to just anything that will help solidify the grip on power of those people who currently control the government? And I would argue, of course, that government's primary interest is, in fact, to keep their grip on power. And therefore, uh, we should have no reason to expect that overall government advertising campaigns would tend to promote true ideas rather than false ones. And therefore, we should severely limit, if not completely eliminate, uh, government's ability to engage in advertising uh, or, as I said, to use a more pejorative term, propaganda. Start a government information program, there should be a burden of proof that the government would have to meet that the private sector can't sufficiently provide information in this area on its own. Uh, I would also suggest that uh, there's a big difference between government providing information uh, about you know, pr private activities, activities where individuals have strong incentives to acquire information of their own, uh, and information about uh, public goods in the economic sense of the term, where the private incentives to acquire information might be less. But there is a caveat, and that is that the less incentive individuals have to acquire information on their own, the more ability government has to uh, engage in lies and deception in its own information campaigns. So while there, there's a stronger case for government information campaigns, there's also a stronger reason for concern uh, to be worried about what government will do. I will say lastly that I think Steve is right. Uh, advertising information is less uh, dangerous than uh, direct government coercion. However, the link between the two may in some cases be stronger than he says, uh, because as we've seen in the area of smoking, once government started a propaganda campaign against smoking, which by the way I think was accurate in most of its claims, uh, it did not stop there, but also went to the point of outlawing smoking even in private establishments like bars and the like. I know I think Judge Bork probably doesn't approve of that, uh, but uh, nonetheless I think the connection between the two activities is definitely there. Uh, yeah, I think this, this is a, an, an important debate that we're uh, having on the conservative side between libertarians like Ilya and more, uh, I don't know what the proper word would be, social conservatives, traditional conservatives like uh, Steve and myself. Uh, I, I would say, though, that you don't have to live uh, as uh, I do uh, in the heart of uh, left liberal land uh, to know, because we all know, that uh, when the left uh, gets hold of the levers of power, they will, while pretending to observe a strict neutrality as between competing, competing moral ideals, they will actually use those levers ruthlessly to pursue a left liberal moral agenda. They will proclaim the doctrine of neutrality every moment as they drive the Catholic Church out of the adoption business in Massachusetts or commit whatever the next atrocity they have planned is. So on our side, I think the importance of this debate is that we conservatives have to decide whether 
when we hold the levers of power, we will try to actually achieve the neutrality that liberals aspire to, and which uh, I think Steve and I think is actually simply an illusion. And Ilya might have a, uh, a more uh, uh, hopeful idea about. Or whether we will use those levers within a disciplined, prudential set of judgments to advance what we believe is necessary in order to uphold and to some extent, again within the limits of prudence, to rebuild the moral integrity uh, of the culture. For my part, I don't like the ratchet that we will find ourselves in if every time the liberals get power, they pursue aggressively, ruthlessly, as I say, their moral agenda. And every time we have access to any governmental power, we simply try to do as little with it as possible to, to retreat to as strict a neutrality as we uh, possibly can. I don't think in the long run that's a good strategy on the conservative side, although I have to say that uh, Ilya and the libertarians have a, an important uh, argument, which is why I think we need to be having the debate we're having. The other point I would make just uh, in response to Ilya's comments is uh, we've fallen into, we, we just do in this culture, and, and even those of us who, uh, who are small government types and believe in federalism, just naturally fall into thinking that if, the, if, if an argument about whether government should or shouldn't do something is an argument about whether Congress and the President, whether the government of the United States, the national government should and shouldn't do it. It's very important in this area to remember that matters of public morality, the concern for public morality, uh, is in our political tradition primarily and overwhelmingly the province of the states and not of the national government. Where I, or I dare say Bob, would want to see government exercising some power to protect public morality, that would overwhelmingly by and large be state and local decision making, not national decision making, with all of the prudential protections that I think that, uh, that, uh, that builds in when you let the people of Cincinnati resolve the pornography question one way and let the people of Greenwich Village resolve it the other way, even though if I were in Greenwich Village, I would be one of the six dissenting votes. Uh, okay, let's go to the audience. Please identify yourself. State My name is Julian Tepper. I've never uh, heard a panel, um, I've never been before a panel where I found so much to de disagree with uh, people who disagree with each other. <laughs> Uh, so completely, uh, and it leads me to believe that there are no experts in this area, um, and that uh, if some of you had your way, uh, the way Galileo was treated, it, we'd still be treating him the same way now, because if there is such a thing as morality, it's immutable, because nothing can change it, because if you act differently, you're acting immoral. Uh, and I could apply that to all of the arts and, and all of the various kinds of classical thinking. I don't think that uh, anybody's son is going to live less of a Torah life because he saw the uh, previews before Spider-Man 3. Why? Because the, uh, the centering of that person comes from his family. On the other hand, I don't think there's government over here and family over here because family isn't organized. Sure, there are PTAs and there are synagogues and churches and all that. There's government. It's organized. Thirdly, I think if you defined morality before you started saying what you were saying, you'd see, uh, in some cases, the absurdity of the things you said, because I don't think you'll be able to define morality in a way that you could say the things you said about it. I, I just don't think that's possible. Life is a continuum. It's not a snapshot. You know? And if what you believed was true, were true, where, where would you take that snapshot and continue the morality for the rest of time? It, 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 you can't do it. If you think that uh, it's immoral, I don't see smoking as a moral issue, but if you think it is because it can take time away from your family, or I don't think drinking is a moral issue either. I think perhaps drinking to excess may be, but if, you, if, you, if you're going to take time away from your family as being the moral part of the moral issue, then why not outlaw people working 20-hour days? because that just as much takes people away from their families. I think you all are on the wrong course when it comes to this. Morality is the sum total of what certain people at a certain time in a certain area of the world or a certain area of the country believe. 
And you're not, you can, sure, you can punish them for believing it that way. You can punish them for acting the way they believe. You can try to influence them not to act that way by laws that you pass, but you've never gotten close to morality. You just haven't. Let me yeah. ask you something. I, I, stay there. <laughs> Please. It's the moral thing I, to I, do. I, I'd like to know whether you and I disagree about whether there is a timeless and objective morality or whether we just disagree about the content of the timeless and objective morality. Are, are, are you saying that you disagree with me and, and you deny that there is a timeless and objective morality? No, what I'm saying is that if somebody thought that, the natural consequence, and could enforce it, the natural consequence of that is that nothing would ever change. It's like perfection. Well, well, you can never re reach perfection because well, if it's perfect, well, well, that's just you'd never change it. Let, let, me, let me ask you a question. I mean, so you agree with me that there is a timeless and objective morality? That there is a timeless, timeless and objective morality. And objective morality. That's right. If you Murder define what you mean wrong. by morality and where you would apply that, I might agree with you in certain cases. Is it moral okay. to walk up to a kid, immoral to walk up to a kid and smack him in the nose for no reason at all? Sure. But is it immoral for women to work? Because at some point that was thought to be immoral. Fine. That's all, not timeless. All, all you have now established is that we disagree about the content of the timeless and objective morality. Well, that's not a, that, I'm sorry, not but that, I think I've established a lot more than that. You've and established I think that, that there that, is not a timeless, and, that there is a ti not a timeless and objective morality. Okay, tell me, give me an example of a timeless and objective morality. No pushing Jews into gas ovens anywhere ever. Okay, suppose you get pushed into a gas oven to see what it was like, what they did in those gas ovens. Uh, 50 years ago. Suppose somebody says, uh, somebody's kid says, I don't want to see that gas oven. And you're the father and you say, I want <laughs> you to see where a lot of us were murder, killed. But, okay, I'm going to okay. push you into that gas oven to take a look at it. Pushing Jews into gas ovens to kill them. Okay. Timeless wanna, and objective morality or not? If, if you want to say that it's immoral to kill people senselessly, I'll agree with you there. Fine. Okay. But is it immoral to kill people? No. That, we go to war. We execute. Uh, okay. Well, I think it's so. We a just have a debate about what the content. That's a big of the debate. That's not just a debate. Fine. That's a big. I, we debate. have to have it retail, not wholesale. We have to go issue by issue. I thought you were. Making That's why you can't define morality. You can give instances of immoral behavior, but I defy you to define moral morality. It's simply the sum total of what certain people think at a certain time. There were people in Germany during Nazi so Germany was it, who thought was it, it was not immoral to so shove did, Jews into gas chambers. So the fact that some people don't think it's immoral to push Jews into gas ovens and kill them means that it's not immoral? No, and but not that's, immoral all immoral, that's all morality is. It's what the people think at the time. So if they and thought at the time that it's okay, no, then it's, it's not okay. that it's okay. It's that it changes. Okay, we okay. need to go, go to the next, the next speaker. Thank you. Hi, my name is Howie Slug, and it's a question first for Professor Soman, but after anyone could agree or disagree. Uh, under your conception of government, is there any sphere where it's trustworthy and efficient enough that it's worthwhile for the average person to leave the state of nature and give up certain natural law rights to get government? Uh, sure, it depends on the incentives of government in a particular area. However, my argument in the presentation was that its incentives with respect to cultural regulation are particularly bad because cultural regulation gives those who hold the levers of power uh, an opportunity to suppress their opposition and engage in indoctrination. Uh, there are other areas, and we can talk in detail about particular areas if you're interested, uh, where that's not true or it's much less true than in the sphere of cultural regulation. Uh, but in general, uh, I think there are also areas Areas, uh, the vast majority of areas where the, the private sector will in fact be better. Uh, in the particular uh, sphere which we're discussing now, I just think the government's incentives are especially bad, even worse than in most other areas of uh, where government might seek to regulate. I, I want to follow up on that by asking Ilya about cultural regulation a little more specifically, and that is, would, do you endorse uh, the harm principle? Would you decriminalize uh, drug possession? Um, and um, the prostitution and all the other dueling. offenses of that kind, dueling, for example. And do you, do you think that the effort by government to shape the public culture with respect to dueling uh, was, a, was a, a valid and, and useful thing for government to do? Uh, I would certainly say that with respect to the first several things on your list, with respect to dueling, uh, I don't have as strong feelings about, but I think probably, yes, dueling should be legal. In practice, I think that it, today it wouldn't really matter very much whether it was legal or not because so few people would want to engage in it. Uh, but 
uh, I don't have a problem with it, and I think that if people want to uh, engage in completely consensual dueling, uh, I the, don't see the why the reason it would be people harmful. don't want to duel today is because there was a successful morals campaign brought to eliminate dueling, and the public culture was changed using the law in part to do that, and that create, created a changed culture. If you remove those laws, you might change the culture back again and have not only dueling but maybe snuff films and who, who knows what else. Well, first of all, there's a big difference between snuff films, which I think are almost certainly non-consensual, uh, and dueling, which at least as we've defined it here, is consensual. Second, uh, you, I know you've made a broader argument that uh, well, if we remove a government prohibition of people who think it's permissible and moral, uh, I think first, I'm not convinced that the empirical evidence necessarily says that's true, that anything that is legalized, therefore everybody suddenly thinks that it's moral. Uh, second, if it is true, uh, then uh, that should lead us to worry all the more about government forbidding things which it should not forbid because that might change the cultural in harmful ways even beyond the uh, coercion involved in and of itself. Uh, and I guess, uh, and I guess, finally, uh, if it really is the case that people are, you know, largely conflating government enforcement and morality, then maybe that's the cultural problem that we should be focusing on. Uh, that people have begun to conflate in their own minds government and morals, uh, whereas in reality there should be a stronger separation in their minds on this. Uh, and perhaps if those who uh, devote their time promoting government morals campaigns would instead devote their time to uh, leading people to. Uh, separate out morals from government more in their minds, uh, we might have more uh, productive results. Next question. <laughs> Name and affiliation. Yeah, my name is Catherine Jenkins, and I'm the student uh, president at Louisiana State University. And I had the opportunity to go this year to the student symposium, which was a weekend full of law and morality. So this is kind of a great refresher on that. Uh, and it's interesting to me how this subject seems to always stir up a lot of emotions. and. Professor Calabresi, you might have remembered that at that symposium, I asked you uh, a question about uh, vaccinations for young women against uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, and quite frankly, uh, at the symposium and here, I've been a little annoyed to find that a lot of times when um, professors or um, whoever are talking about law and morality, they often talk about theory and not about um, really what can be done. And um, Professor Soman, you did touch on that. You said that planned communities, um, perhaps uh, private schools, and um, also the church could help in instilling morality into in different people. Um, I actually attended private school and have been affiliated with a Protestant church my whole life, didn't live in a planned community. I think I turned out fine, but also came from an upper middle class married family with four children. Um, I think that a lot of the decline in morality have comes from, arguably without stepping on toes, lower middle class, impoverished, and people on welfare. Um, we see this in people addicted to video games because they don't have parents taking care of them after school, or you know the commercials that are uh, bombarding us about sex and how it's okay. Um, the FCC does a terrible job of regulating the things that are on television, and if we look to government, legalized marijuana, for instance, legalized abortion, legalized gay marriage, Obviously, the government isn't doing a very good job either. So if we can't rely on government and we can't rely on the family or the church or these institutions that you're talking about, who is responsible for our morality and how are we supposed to enforce it? Uh, I guess that question may be at least to some extent directed at me, so I'll, I'll have a brief answer and maybe others can comment. Uh, I think many, much of the harms that you point to, yes, I think to a large extent, uh, many problems are more concentrated in the lower economic classes, uh, but it is those economic classes uh, whose behavior has been most influenced and controlled by government over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, and as many uh, conservative and libertarian scholars have pointed out, government, at least until recently, extensively subsidized harmful behavior of various types. When with the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, government removed some of that subsidy, we saw a rapid drop in that, even without any kind of imposition of censorship or the sorts of measures that Judge Bork advocates in his book. There's also another interesting test case of this that I have alluded to earlier, which is the case of Japan. Japan has even less morals regulation than we do uh, with things like they prostitution and the like. Can, can, can I finish, please? Uh, Japan has even less morals regulation in this area than we do, but because for the most part they never adopted our 
uh, harmful policy of government subsidizing in this area, uh, they have very low levels of social pathology. So the bottom line is, if government simply doesn't subsidize harmful behavior, while at the same time allowing private institutions uh, to do their thing, then we can look forward to very low levels of social pathology, and we already have made great progress in that area over the last 10 or 12 years. Well, it's obvious that Ilya and I disagree about a lot of things. We also agree on uh, some things, and I imagine Steve would and Dan would uh, join us. We certainly don't want government subsidizing destructive uh, behavior. We certainly do want greater empowerment of parents and of religious institutions and other institutions of civil society. The more choice there is in education, opportunities for religiously uh, grounded schools, like the schools to which Dan says his children, sends his children and so forth, this is common ground. Uh, I think uh, within the uh, conservative uh, uh, movement. Uh, th the, the dispute breaks out, of course, at the point at which we're talking about trying to shield kids from the destructive uh, elements of the public culture. Is simply getting government subsidy out of the picture uh, going to be sufficient? Now, I agree with you, and I, I guess Elia just agreed with you as well, that the harmful effects of uh, bad ideas and practices and bad choosing are going to be felt the most severely by those who are poorest and most vulnerable. That's the point I made in my blurb uh, for Judge Bork's book because he had made it uh, in the book. There's a, there's a terrific book by Ma Myron Magnet of the, uh, of the uh, Manhattan Institute called uh, the, the Dream and the Nightmare about the impact of the liberationist ideology of the 1960s uh, on uh, poor people who weren't actually responsible for developing that uh, ideology. Uh, but it's a mistake, I think, to suppose that those who are well-to-do uh, are immune from the effects. They're just better able to deal with the consequences. Uh, I live in a very affluent community, Princeton, New Jersey, and uh, Pr Princeton High School in many ways is uh, the public high school is a terrific high school every year. They're great placement of kids into the elite universities and high achievers and so forth. But there is also a very serious drug problem. Now, the difference between Princeton High School and Trenton High School down the street is the parents of the kids in Princeton High School at least have the resources to try to help them deal with drug addiction once they're addicted. But the parents by themselves, doing the best they can, can very often not prevent the, the, the impact of the culture on the kids in terms of things like, like drug addiction. That's, that's going to be a problem in Trenton. It's going to be a problem in Princeton. Uh, it's really bad what's happening in Princeton. And the fact that, that parents are able, by and large, to get counseling for kids and to try to get them off drugs, not always successfully, shouldn't lead us to conclude that this is just a problem of the lower socioeconomic groups. It's not. Next. Hi, uh, David Wagner, Regent University. This panel has helped me clarify something that I think I've always felt to be a difficulty about libertarianism. And that is its tendency to make a premature leap to a very high level of generality. Case in point from this panel, Steve put on the, <clears throat> on the hypothetical ballot a proposition to that government should uh, discourage, for example, abortion or perhaps gambling on the analogy of the way that it has used public advertising to discourage smoking. In response, Ilya raise that to the level of generality of government having advertising campaigns in general. Now, I, I come back to this idea of a virtual ballot because I think that propositions should be talked about in terms of what's actually proposed. The proposal to, you know, let, saying let's have a state government campaign to discourage gambling is not the same as let's have a state campaign to encourage all morality all morality to be defined by whoever was in office at the time. I would definitely vote against the latter, but I'd vote for the former. And there's been a change of subject there when we go from one to, to the other. Starting is, is, is this I picking up on my point that Judge Bork is a Burkean? <laughs> uh, sh should I answer? Or? Yeah, well, go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I guess, let me put that in the form with a, a clear, more clearly informal question. Why when someone's, when Steve says, let's have government at some level, let's, let's, let's do, we put the federal equivalent to one side, let's make it a local government, as local as you like. Let's have government have, uh, let's have our local government 
uh, start an advertising campaign against gambling. Uh, is it necessary, would be my question, to raise that automatically to the question, should government in general have the power to advertise in general against immoral things in general? Yeah, my answer to that question is yes, and let me try to explain why. I think this does go to the core insight, or at least one of the core insights of the libertarian perspective on government. And that is that government is not just a set of discrete policies that we can sort of choose like from a menu and say, well, we favor A, but B, we don't favor, even though conceptually the two may be similar. Rather, government is a set of institutions. Uh, and when an, that institution is set up, that means putting people in charge of that institution. That means giving them power. Uh, and if you give government the power to advertise in the area of smoking, or in the area of dueling, or in the area, uh, I'm not a uh, gambling, I think it was I'm you mentioned, gambling, yeah. uh, that means there's an institutional apparatus, a government advertising agency or regulatory agency, which can then be used for other purposes. So uh, when you're in power in your locality, perhaps it'll be used to discourage gambling, uh, but someday your political opponents will win and they can use it for other purposes. And moreover, uh, for a wide variety of reasons, it's much easier to expand the power of these institutions once they're set up than to constrict them. Because that, and, and so therefore, uh, government institutions are in fact package deals and not just discrete policies. And when you look to see whether we want to establish these institutions, you have to ask yourself, do I want to buy the package deal and not just do I want to buy this particular narrowly isolated product? Let me try this just one more time in desperation. <laughs> Liber one of the core government functions all libertarians concede to government is enforcing contracts. But maybe we shouldn't give government the power to enforce contracts because after all, government has an inherent conflict of interest and it might choose to enforce contracts that increase its power and not enforce contracts that, that decrease its power. Uh, well, there, there is a danger in that area, and it's part of the reason why in the area of contracts it is good at least to have parallel private institutions like arbitration as well. Uh, but notice that government enforcement of traditional criminal law and the like uh, is, is hedged around with a wide range of procedural and institutional obstacles, uh, ones that many government morals campaigns uh, in enforcement of victimless crimes, it's much more difficult to impose those procedural obstacles because of the, the difficulty of gathering evidence and the like. Moreover, the danger of government in this area, I think, is cumulative. That is, the more it grows, the more, uh, the greater the, the increase in the risk. So the fact that a very small and narrowly constrained government government may not pose that much risk of expansion or overkill uh, does not mean that a very large and complex government doesn't pose more of a risk. I completely disagree with this. It really? seems to me that uh, public morals laws are actually part of the traditional criminal law. It's the new idea. It's the kind of libertarian innovation that would say we need to uh, eliminate those even from the province of the general jurisdiction of, uh, of the states as governments that protect uh, public health, safety, and morals and advance the common good. The other thing is, far from being uh, more dangerous because it's difficult to gather evidence, the reality, I think this is true even historically and can be shown, is that it's just very difficult to be too aggressive in enforcing uh, these, uh, these laws because they tend, the behavior tends to happen in private. As I recall, Griswold, the Griswold decision had to be a set up case between a sympathetic prosecutor uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the people who wanted to challenge the law constitutionally and had trouble getting standing. As I recall, Bowers versus Hardwick was a case where the prosecutor had to be talked into uh, re re reviving uh, the, uh, the uh, prosecution in order to, uh, uh, to get standing. And the, in, in, in that context, I think it's worth noting that as, you know, as far back as Aristotle, uh, it, theorists of public morality have noted that one of the primary ways in which the law functions in the moral domain is precisely as a teacher. I think Dan or, or, or Stephen made this point before. It's the pedagogical function of law. Why, do we have the, why did we have the big debate over something like Bowers? It's not because the anti-sodomy laws were being enforced that much. It was rather because the teaching function of the law. The folks on the sexual liberationist side wanted law to teach one lesson. The folks on the more traditional side wanted law to teach a, a, a different method. So I don't think it creates a risk of totalitarianism by any means to have these laws. The fact that they're difficult to, uh, to enforce means that we're going to just get less opportunities to, uh, uh, to debate uh, whether or not a particular case of enforcement was legitimate. I just wanted to follow up with that uh, by asking Ilya about uh, gambling decriminalization, because gambling decriminalization was presented in the late 1960s and 1970s as a way of legalizing a so-called victimless crime. and. Um, it very rapidly changed into a situation where 
most states have lotteries and now run ads encouraging people to gamble. Uh, we don't sim we haven't simply decriminalized gambling. We've actually we actually are publicly encouraging it and endorsing it in a whole host of ways. Why wouldn't precisely the same thing happen in other areas if we decriminalized other things as well? well I just have two responses to that. One is that did not happen in the case of uh, alcohol prohibition. Uh, to my knowledge, government does not. Uh, actively promote the consumption of alcohol. In, Second, some, in some states, you have to buy alcohol in state-run liquor stores. Okay. Uh, my, I stand corrected on that small point, but the broader <laughs> point, I think, still holds that in most areas, government uh, has not done that. But the second point is, uh, yes, I think it's bad if government tries to promote alcohol consumption or uh, gambling, but I think the harms of that are far outweighed by the harms of prohibition, namely that uh, when we had gambling prohibition and alcohol prohibition, that it greatly increased the amount of violent crime as black market uh, as black marketeers competed with each other in the only way they could. And in addition, uh, we imprisoned thousands upon thousands of people for engaging in the sorts of activity and caused great harm to them, far greater harm uh, than is caused by the underlying activity itself. Uh, so I think the problem of government uh, you know, promotion of gambling and the like, uh, that I think is part of the more general problem that we have with government advertising campaigns and propaganda campaigns. And the ultimate solution is to generally limit the power of government in all these areas uh, and not to prohibit more things. I want to note one very small thing about victimless crimes and enforcement. It's true. When you get to the Bowers versus Hardwick situation, uh, where a law is extremely unpopular and most people don't want to enforce it, it probably won't be enforced very much. On the other hand, when there are strong social forces that do want to enforce these laws, as with the war on drugs, then the law enforcement tactics become far more aggressive and dangerous uh, than they do in other areas. And there's a lot of excellent social science research in this area that I can point you to if, uh, if people are interested. Oh, yeah, I think that's really really a, a, a very serious uh, overgeneralization. Uh, as a matter of fact, the laws against sodomy were not aggressively enforced, enforced even in periods which were actually fairly recent. I mean, there was a time fairly recently when public opinion was quite overwhelmingly against uh, sodomy and homosexual uh, acts. Last, have, qu last question. I have a very brief question for uh, Professor Selman. Our kind of shared libertarian philosophy is based on an intellectual assumption of valid consent. But I think one of the arguments that Professor George and Professor Calabrese are making is a lot of the effects of offensive material or offensive activities fall on children who, under our legal system, are presumed not to have valid consent. So how would you dispute the argument that this justifies you know, limited censorship or limited government activity in order to prevent what under those terms is a coercive externality? Uh, I guess I would dispute it in, in two ways. Uh, one of it I've already alluded to, and that is that private institutions can do a far better job in this area uh, than public ones. Uh, in particular, we have private schools, we have private planned communities, we have a wide variety of other institutions, uh, and I think if government stayed out of the way of those institutions more, they could actually do more in this area uh, than they currently do. So it's not that I don't think effects on children are important or that I think the children can consent in the same way as adults do. It's rather that uh, parents and pr other pri and private institutions can do a better job of raising our children uh, than the government can do. Uh, if it does take a village, as Hillary Clinton said, then uh, the appropriate uh, village that it should take is a a village of private sector organizations uh, rather than uh, the village government uh, or, or the like. Uh, I guess the second way would dispute it is that this matter cuts both ways. Uh, that just as children uh, maybe cannot consent to certain private activities, children also have very little in the way of political influence. And as a result, if we leave more power in the hands of the private sector, I'm sorry, the public sector, uh, the interest of children uh, are in many ways likely to be neglected far more than otherwise. Uh, and it's striking to me that, uh, the, that the, many of the politically powerful groups in our society are ones whose interests are inimical to children uh, rather than uh, supportive of them. You know, I'd, I'd just uh, make, make, make the point that uh, uh, Ilya even here has slipped into the libertarian uh, rhetoric of contrasting situation A, government raises children, with situation B, parents raise children. And those are just false options. Uh, the question is not whether it takes a village in Hillary Clinton's sense. Uh, the question is whether government has a subsidiary, strictly subsidiary, but substantial role in assisting parents and others who want to keep their kids off drugs, out of premarital, uh, 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 sexuality, 
uh, out of all the pathologies that, that parents are up against now in the, uh, in the culture, and whether government has a role for that, and if so, what that role is. And uh, not only is the role subsidiary, uh, those of us on the side that's critical of libertarianism also allow that there are a range of prudential considerations that would militate against government uh, regulation or proscription, or at least limit the means that government may legitimately uh, use to do that. So I, I think the debate should not be placed as starkly uh, as some on the libertarian side want to uh, uh, place it. And even Ilya, who's been careful about it in his rhetoric here at the end, has slipped into it as if it's these these extremes of the government raises children or parents raise children. It's a far narrower debate, one in which I again repeat, libertarians and those of us on the other side do agree about halfway or better when it comes to promoting families, churches, other institutions who all too often are the victims of government intrusion. That we agree on. Well, on that unifying note, let me, uh, let me thank the panel and also uh, just note that obviously the arguments and the uh, analysis of Judge Bork's, uh, Judge Bork in Slashing Towards Gomorrah, which has spurred this really you know, stimulating, excellent at times, even heated discussion, shows um, just how current the book is, how current his, the arguments are, and Judge Bork's uh, really sort of further intellectual, um, uh, in intellectual leadership. So thank you to the panel. Good job. I'm usually in this seat. We're adjourned and we reconvene at 4.15. I know what it's like. Yeah, I can understand that, certainly. Good job. Very good. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. The problem in the end is, and I agree with you, you can always make the arguments.